Okay, we are live. Uh, welcome to Boston Basic Income. Uh, there will be a few more people showing up here uh, shortly. Uh, we had uh, some technical difficulties in that the legs fell off our uh, camera tripod. Uh, so you might notice that the camera is a little bit lower today. Uh, so I'm Alex Howlett. This week we are talking about Say's Law. So Jean-Baptiste Say was a early 19th century French economist, and he's famous for uh, Say's Law. I mean, he was a real economist and did real economisty things, uh, but this is what he's known for. Uh, and Say's Law basically says uh, supply creates its own demand. Uh, now, that sounds interesting. Um, Elizabeth is here. Um, <laughs> What are your thoughts on Say's Law and how it might relate to basic income? You can pass if you want. <laughs> and people on the live stream can... Uh... No. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I don't have like a lot... I mean, it feels like, okay, like relevant to basic income in the sense that it talks about like, okay, when you're like creating a thing like you're paying people for the parts and for the labor until you're like putting money into the economy and so that feels like an obvious like right we could just skip that part and like just put money into the economy especially because there's a bunch in the article about like oh well, you can get gluts of certain kind that you're supplying too much of certain things which and then say is like oh and that means that then you're under supplying other things and so i could certainly imagine an argument in which it's like well okay instead of trying because you like you talk a lot about using the labor market inefficiently as a way to get money to consumers and so if instead of being like oh well we're we're kind of guessing because the market is imperfect about what things we should be creating and so for like oh we're just paying people to make things that maybe the economy doesn't need if instead you're just like oh we can just give money to consumers and then they can tell us Right. what it is that they want the economy to produce by buying more of it or just like literally telling salespeople, hey, like you don't stock this thing, I would buy it if you had it. Yeah, I think there's this assumption with Say's Law that um, if the economy is producing too much of one thing, um, that means that those resources aren't being used optimally. That it must be the case that um, if people don't want those things, they would want uh, something else for, you know, they would want those resources to be producing something else that they would want more. Yeah. Um, and I think in, intuitively that kind of makes sense. Um, I think, you know, uh, for sure we want to live in a world where um, if stuff is available that we want, we're able to buy it. Yeah. Uh, and an optimistic interpretation of Say's Law is that uh, that's usually the case minus some in, some minor inefficiencies that correct themselves or something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's the real the reality. I don't think that always happens, and I think uh, basic income can be a big part of of correcting that. Like you mm -hmm. said, if you give people money, um, then they're you know if you give them enough money, they're able to buy everything the economy can produce. And as long as you're always committing to uh, giving people as much money as the economy can handle, then Say's law becomes true, right? Uh, the economy, uh, you know, anytime we come up with a new way to produce stuff that people want, people are going to buy it because they're going to have money to buy it. Um, so I think that's that's kind of like the connection to, to basic income uh, that, that I feel. Uh, it's kind of why I chose this article or this topic. Um, people on the live stream, uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, I don't know if you have any other thoughts before we get to quotes from the article. Um, I think I'm probably good in this moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here's the first one. Say at first denied that a general glut could exist. Some goods can be oversupplied, he conceded, but goods in general cannot. His reasoning became known as Say's Law. It is production which opens a demand for products. Or, in a later, snappier formulation, supply creates its own demand. So I guess to get into the intuition here a little bit more, um, you can think of it as if people want to buy something, then they will produce something to sell in order that they can buy the thing that they want. Uh, so if there's a shiny thing out there that people really want, uh, people are going to be like, ooh, I want that shiny thing. So there's the supply creating the demand. 
And then uh, in order to be able to get the shiny thing, they have to produce a shiny thing of their own uh, that other people want. So the supply creates demand, which creates supply kind of on and on throughout the economy. And of course, that's, that's true to some extent. Um, if you don't want anything, um, then you're not going to work to get anything because you don't really care. Uh, so of course that's true, but I think it, you know, it also goes the other way, right? Um, if you want something, if people really want, you know, a hypothetical shiny thing, then some people are going to be like, man, I wish we had a way to like produce this hypothetical shiny thing so that, so that everyone could buy it and, and we could, we could get some, you know, like we get some of the things that we want. So I think, I think it, you know, it goes in both directions. Um, and then the question we can ask is, is kind of which one is the, is kind of the dominant force. Uh, and I think for me, I always feel like the answer has to be uh, demand. And this is consistent with Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith said, uh, the consumption is the sole end and purpose of all production. And the interest of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary for promoting that of the consumer. So, you know, the whole point is that um, without anybody to consume the products, there's no point in having any products, right? It's all about, um, you know, kind of demand is, 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 is what fundamentally drives at everything. Uh, the economy exists for the benefit of the people. If there was, if there was no benefit, uh, then there would be no economy, right? Um, so I think, I think Say really wanted to think about it the other way around, and he imagined that um, he imagined that if you're producing, if you're producing stuff, uh, and people didn't have enough money to buy it, or you know couldn't find, you know maybe they could only sell a little bit of stuff or something like that, then prices would adjust and everything would get sold, and you know you wouldn't end up in a situation where uh, stuff was going unproduced because people didn't want to buy it, or stuff was going unbought even though it was being produced uh, because people couldn't buy it. Um, and I think that kind of makes sense um, if you ignore money, right? Um, so one of the key properties of money is that uh, it's a stable standard uh, unit of value. It's a common language of trade in which you know, markets can set prices. If all prices go down across the entire economy, then your money isn't working properly anymore, right? So that means that uh, it's impossible for the scenario in which you know things are being produced and people don't aren't able to buy them and all the prices just come down and that's kind of what what say is depending on in order for his law to work um, so this is fundamental to the nature of money and I think part of the reason why he feels uh, like this situation is possible is that he's not thinking about money he's just thinking about um, people produce goods and they trade with each other you know businesses produce things and trade everybody's producing goods and it's all about trading goods for goods and money is just this thing that kind of facilitates the transactions he's not realizing that that money actually does have a real effect on on the economy's ability to allocate uh, goods and services uh, so Tommy on the live stream has a question he says, so supply creates its own demand. It's kind of like saying that entrepreneurs know their customers' desire better than their customers do. Well, not exactly. Uh, I, I, I give uh, Jean-Baptiste to say a little more credit than that. I think it's more like saying uh, there's a bunch of entrepreneurs out there and maybe they're all idiots, uh, but the ones who uh, produce something that is useful to people um, will, uh, will, you know, uh, be uh, inducing demand in, in the potential customers. So if you create something that customers really value, uh, then customers are going to be able to buy it. Uh, so that's kind of his assumption. He's not assuming that, uh, every, that, that producers are smarter than, than consumers or something like that. Um, and then Tommy says, uh, key property of money, having uh, unilaterally more of it is never bad. It doesn't take up inventory space. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to some extent that's true. You know, money doesn't use up any resources. Uh, it doesn't cost anything to just have a bunch of money. It's like, oh, now I'm going to carry all this money around or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's also true that it's possible for there to be too much of it in the sense that there's too much spending and then you get inflation uh, and the, or not enough of it and then you get, you get deflation, not enough spending. Um, and, and that kind of comes back to what I was talking about before, about it needs to be a stable standard of unit, unit of value. So that means we need to have institutions in place 
to manage the flow of money so that uh, the amount of money chasing each good remains consistent from day to day. That's how we can, we can forget about thinking about what money is worth and think about what everything else is worth in terms of money because we can just trust that money is kind of like the stable standard unit. Um, yeah, any thoughts before we move on to another one? Mm, nothing good. Man, I had like 20 quotes for tonight and I was like, man, I gotta cut these down and I was like deleting them. <laughs> Uh, but we can get to other parts of the article. Yes. Yeah. Hey guys. I still have faith in our ability to not get through all the quotes. Yeah. Oh, Richard is listening to us on the live stream. That's great. Uh, so uh, if you could, if you could you that, that would be good. Oh, you're upstairs. Uh huh. Oh. Uh, oh, sorry about that. I was wondering where you guys were. Uh, so yeah, we, I mean, we just got started here. Um, any initial thoughts on Sage Law? Oh, Bethany's here too. Look Everybody's at this. here. Hey, it's been a while. How's it going? Yeah. Good. How are you? Good. Yeah, we've been booming around rooms too much, and oh, these guys really? were upstairs. Also, the legs fell off the tripod. That's weird. What happened? Yeah, the legs were over there. The legs? The legs fell the off. They, oh. they all fell off in like, different ways. <laughs> oh, directions. I'm now yeah. realizing what that usually looks like. Great. Yeah, yeah. it usually has little uh, legs. So, we're just getting started. Uh, we've actually gone through the first couple quotes. Okay. Um, but first, first uh, one quote. Like, did you give uh, like um, an intro yeah. to Say's Law? And if so, intro to Say's Law. So supply creates its own demand, and um, <laughs> basically uh, the idea is that uh, if uh, producers can produce things that people want, uh, then they'll be able to sell those things because the people will say, "Oh, I want those things," and then they will in turn produce things that other people want in order to to be able to buy the thing that they want. So the supply creates demand, which creates supply. And then we were, we were kind of contrasting that with demand creates supply, which creates demand. So you can right. kind of start from either point. Um, so we've said a few few thoughts, we've had a few thoughts on it, but I'd like to hear your initial thoughts on this. Yeah, so yeah. Um, is part of the idea that you will lower the price until people buy it? Is mm -hmm. that part of the idea? Yeah. And if so, what about if the price goes below, like you can't lower the price below production cost, for example, so how do they deal with that constraint in the models? Well, if other prices, um, if, if, your price, if you're lowering your price um, so low that you can't lower it any further, um, then other people might be lowering their prices too. So the supply might go down, so the, your, your price to produce might go down. Yeah, I mean, Say's Say law was not about a specific producer. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about the economy as a whole. Oh, so thinking okay. about about it from a macro perspective, that if you, um, if in general the economy is capable of producing things for people, uh, then people are going to buy those things, mm -hmm. right? A, sp a particular producer might go out of business. That's definitely right. What, what time period was this? Time? Early nineteenth century, France. Eighteen oh eight. Oh, quite a while ago. Yeah. So he was shortly after Adam Smith. Uh, the article talks about how he had a copy of Wealth of Nations that was heavily annotated and stuff like that. He was one of the first real professional economists, maybe the first uh, like wow. French economist. Yeah. And uh, and so had they not had a lot of like boom and bust cycles yet? Because it was early times for that kind of economy. Oh, they were going, I mean, this was the time, the time of Napoleon and, you know, Battle of Waterloo. And there was all kinds, oh, there was, a, you know, in South America, there were, there were business ventures that were going bust. And he was literally living through a time when, and it talks about this in the article, I'm not just like, I don't just know everything about Jean-Baptiste Say. Um, he was living through a time when, when you, if you looked at the economy, most people would say, okay, there's an oversupply, there's a general glut, there's more stuff here than people can buy. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a problem. And he was saying, no, that's not really what's happening. What's really happening is that resources are being misallocated. It's not a, an overall economy thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, but that was a good question. Cool. Yeah. And do we have any sense, given that one could kind of start either on the demand side or the supply side, like what led him to focus on supply creating demand instead of the other way around? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, they talked about how he uh, started like a cotton mill business and thought that that would, I mean, like, I think he just, I mean, intuitively it kind of makes sense that if everybody's producing stuff that 
people want. If right. if the economy as a whole is is producing things or capable of producing things that the economy as a whole wants, uh, then why wouldn't that eventually get allocated minus some some you know inefficiencies along the way or or, or you know. Right. And I guess it makes yeah. it makes more intuitive sense to think of like. The natural resources and that kind of thing is the limit and then that creates the supply that you can offer and then people are going to want that or something like that right. kind of thinking process right and and he imagined that this would be a self-correcting thing too right like if i'm producing too many hats or something then uh you know maybe i don't produce as many hats and then those resources go into producing things that people actually do want mm -hmm. so he imagined you know like the wars and political stuff and you know there are various you know um disruptions that go on and he imagined them to be self-correcting mm -hmm. so he wasn't saying the economy is perfect all the time he was kind of saying it tends toward this mm -hmm. right if you leave it kind of to its own devices and, and don't interfere with it you know the, the interferences are you know like the disruptions those are the things that that cause problems and then it, and then if you minimize that then it should move toward this ideal yeah yeah uh, Steve. Uh, well, I can believe that in 1808, there were so few products that if you made anything, you were guaranteed to sell it. Um, so making a product was as good as stimulating the economy or as, was as good as printing money. Um, but I, I don't know that that's true. Now. Yeah. Um, it was certainly probably true in a lot of, a lot of contexts. Hey, Rob. Hey, guys. Hey. Yeah, um, I, I I think the opposite of that was true during during his time and place, okay. during Jean Baptiste Say's time and place, uh, and and the general thinking was that there was oversupply, uh, mm. and he was kind of like countering the common wisdom, yeah, yeah with his thing. Uh, Rob, do you have any initial thoughts on on Say's law? I'm gonna defer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Richard. I asked so many questions. I didn't realize we that's were doing okay. the go around. Yeah. Thing, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he says that you have to produce a certain amount in order of good with your time or your labor or whatever. But what about money producing more money and this? Producing money for its own sake. That says the article said that's the weakness in his law. Yeah, I mean, he imagined. I mean, he abstracted away from money. So he imagined an economy without money as like the the purest form of economy. So Any like kind of or something? yeah, goods for goods, that kind of thing. Um, he acknowledged that money had a role of facilitating transactions, so making it possible uh, for people to trade goods for goods. But money was just kind of like this uh, this intermedi intermediation, this kind of medium of exchange. It wasn't anything beyond that. And certainly the idea that someone would kind of hoard money and accumulate it um, threw a little bit of a wrench into his uh, into his. Like brain. his father going bankrupt with um, French Revolution dollars or whatever? Uh, yeah. Yeah, can, can you say more about that? That's, they said that in the article. Anyhow, um, his father uh, accumulated a bunch of those, and then during the Napoleonic era, they well became worthless. So his father lost a bunch of money, and then he went bankrupt because of that. Apparently. Okay, it's weird. I just read the article like right before we came here, and I don't remember that part. Yeah, I have zero memory of this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe huh. you read it another place about him, or no? I read that in the article. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Cool. All right, uh, but that's about him. yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing because we can see empirically that money has these real effects on on the economy. We can't just ignore it. Um, he might and be there's like international exchange rates as well. Sure. So he might be imagining an ideal money, uh, and he might be imagining that with an ideal money it would work this way. I would argue that even with an ideal money it wouldn't work this way. Um, and we were getting into this a little bit before you guys got here, um, but. An ideal money, if you think about what money is, it's a standard of value. It has to maintain a stable purchasing power. That means that it's not possible for prices to just go down across the entire economy. So if the economy is producing um, you know, extra stuff, 
uh, there needs to be the spending to match that. The prices can't just adjust downward. In an individual market, they can, but not for the not for the whole economy. So Alex, yeah, just trying to take like trying to understand his theory and give it like the best yeah. chance possible. Steel manning it. Yeah, steel yeah. manning it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a term I learned recently. <laughs> um, so you were saying though that it's not just that. That, that when people want to buy the stuff, they'll go and produce other stuff, and so would that be a way to prop the prices up? Like, would that be a way to for supply to create demand without prices going down? In theory, I think I think that's a real thing. If there's something I want um, and I don't have enough money to get it, I might go do some work to earn some money to to buy the thing right. that I want. So the the supply is kind of like. Now I found out about this thing. There's a new supply, yeah. and it's creating demand for me. So I think that's true. That can or be true. Do like leasing of a car type of thing. You don't have to actually buy it. You can lease it, or at least, or like lease a house or sort of thing. I guess. You can yeah. even like rent, sort of rent it, or you can lease the house and to buy or something like that. And there's like. I think right that's home sort of places. I think that falls in the same category. You're you're paying for the service of having access to the car for a period of time, that kind of thing. You're still buying something, right? Yeah. Uh, Rob. Just a, something he said. Do you see, do you say that in an individual market, if supply rises, but the I guess money supply doesn't, prices would drop, but not in the whole economy. That's yes, right. that's right. Where's the line drawn between an individual market and the economy as a whole? Like, isn't the economy just a, yeah. an accumulation of those individual markets? Or so yes, it is. So uh, the line where the line is drawn has to do with how the currency's value is anchored. Uh, so the purchasing power of the currency, uh, we have institutions that keep it stable with respect to the price it, prices of a basket of consumer goods. So it's all about the consumer price index. And the consumer price index is determined by, you know, what people, the, the things that people want and need, the things that people buy in general, right? Um, so as you start, um, as more and more of the prices in the uh, consumer price index go down, more and more other prices in the consumer price index have to go up to balance it out because that's what they're trying to keep stable. Okay. So you can imagine an individual price would move up and down and it wouldn't have that much effect on the other prices right. but if a lot of them started to move down then you'd have to have like a big effect somewhere else with some of the other goods bring right. equilibrium right gotcha. yeah. okay yeah and you can have you know like um a small amount of inflation over time like you know as long as it's not so much that uh people don't know what money is worth anymore or something like that like they need to be able to keep track prices have to mean something from day to day so in the long term you know a little bit of inflation isn't necessarily a problem uh, what's a problem is uh, if, you know, a week from now, $10 doesn't mean the same thing as it means today. Or, or it means it's, it's enough different from, it, from today that I actually have to pay attention to it as an ordinary consumer. Now money's not working the way it's supposed like to work. Like Bitcoin huh. and things like that, you don't know what the price is. Right. You look it up. right. Bitcoin doesn't have institutions that keep its purchasing power stable with respect to a basket of consumer goods. Therefore, it's not currency. Right, and right. And, it, and it can't be currency, and you know it doesn't just kind of like becomes uh, magically stable with respect to consumer goods over time. In the same way that gold never did, right? Like we kept gold stable, um, but it was uh, a little bit of a balancing act, and and it was not uh, sustainable because we had to keep uh, we had to keep the dollar stable relative to gold, and we also had to keep the dollar stable relative to consumer goods, and then we ended up kind of like draining the, the reserves of gold in order to be able to maintain that stability or if we refuse to drain the reserves of gold and we focused on keeping the dollar balanced with uh, with gold if we keep if we focused on keeping the dollar anchor, anchored to gold then we would lose the connection to consumer prices and we get deflation or something like that and the currency would stop functioning properly gotcha yeah okay yeah uh, go ahead, oh we'll just I would like to explore more kind of why it doesn't seem to me like supply does create its own demand in terms of prom prompting people to go like supply other things or whatever the theory would ideally say should happen and I guess I just want to say see if we systematically think that that doesn't happen what's kind of standing in the way I would say that that's something that 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 does happen like we gave the example like if there's something I want I might go and earn some money in order to be able to buy it yeah I'm not yeah. saying it doesn't happen at all but it doesn't seem like it happens commensurate with like the full amount that could be supplied Right. 
And, and the reason is it has to do with kind of what we were just talking about with the stability of, of purchasing power of the currency. Uh, that the, the output of the economy is always going to be constrained by the level of spending. But I was trying to give him his due in terms of like, remember like you, the supply creates like more, you going and making more stuff. So isn't that a way that the prices could be stable? I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I think if we imagine a fixed amount of money um, that's kind of circulating, I guess, I guess if you get the money circulating a lot faster, if it's like the same amount of money where you get it circulating a lot faster somehow. So you're asking if we're, if we're not expanding the amount of money, but we are, um, you know, you are demanding a new thing and then you go out to earn money from somewhere, you're saying maybe that gets the money to move faster so you can buy the thing. I guess so. Thing. I'm just trying to understand like what he was thinking and how it's different from what actually happens. And in, in terms of what he was thinking, I can tell you that he, he was ignoring money. He was... So he, would he have thought that prices would go down or like what was the problem with ignoring money? What was the problem with ignoring money? Mm -hmm. um, so he's, he's imagining a few things. He's imagining that, that people are not accumulating money because so, so the money just kind of keeps circulating. It's not, it, it never like ends up in hordes and people don't accumulate wealth and stuff like that. He's imagining kind of this pure economy where, where everyone's producing what they produce and then uh, trading it for the things they want. And, you know, it's just kind of uh, functioning that way. Everyone has labor to contribute or, or, you know, mostly labor, but, you know, other resources too. And they contribute those resources in order to be able to trade them for other things. And it just kind of works in that way. Well, okay, let's yeah. get rid of money though. Yeah. Let's say that now there were like a bunch of robots. Yeah. Like people might have labor to contribute, but maybe nobody wants to buy it. So maybe they can't go out and earn any money to go buy the stuff. Is that another problem with it? Like he's kind of assuming that everybody has resources to offer, kind of commensurate with what they would want to buy or what the economy would want to give them? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think he is assuming that um, if you want to offer something that's valuable to other people, you have a way of doing that. He's assuming that. Yeah. But isn't he also assuming that's going to be enough to like match the supply that could be created for you? Yeah, and he's imagining that that's part of why the supply is created because you know there's supply that's creating demand, which is inducing people to contribute more labor, which is creating more supply, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I guess I feel like one of the things that naively at least appears to be going wrong, even just abstracting away from money in our yeah. at least in our current economy, is like it's not really clear that. There's all that much that like people really want to hire other people to do for money. That's commensurate with like what the what the food we could produce for them or like the things we could produce for them. They're, like yeah. we talked about here with with all sorts of different issues. Like it's not an economy where it looks like there's tremendous demand for human right. labor. I know unemployment is like technically low, but if it were if there were tremendous demand, you wouldn't have trouble even if you had a criminal record or even if you had like you yeah know, whatever. And, and that's clearly not the case. I think there's this idea that you could imagine a hypothetical economy where everyone's producing their own food and eating it, right? Like that's kind of like a, a hypothetical uh, or something that someone like Jean Baptiste say would would imagine as the default. So everyone's kind of producing their own food and then eating it. And but now you have specialization. Now you have trade and. Um, you're only going to participate in that if it makes you better off. So it has to be the case that trade just makes everyone better off. But in our world, if everybody tried to grow their own food, that would be so wasteful of resources that we'd, we'd kind of destroy the planet like faster than we are now. Um, and, and part of the reason we, humanity has been able to grow so large is because we're using our resources much more efficiently and we're not having everybody grow their own food. So there's no... At, at the level of, you know... 8 billion people in the world, there's no default economy where everyone's kind of doing their own thing and being self-sufficient. That's not like the state of the world that, that exists anymore, if it ever did. I mean, we always had cooperation and, and that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, And even at this time, people didn't always own the land that they were farming and stuff like that. But that's kind of the Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So we have a couple of comments on the live stream. Uh, Michael says, if something newer and better would be produced, wouldn't that eliminate the need for some things somewhere else not to not be produced anymore? Um, I think it depends. Um, economists like to say that people's uh, wants are infinite, 
Uh, so if something newer and better uh, is produced and you only have a certain number of those things, then maybe people would, you know, the people who don't have the newer, better things would still want some of the old things. And there's also a knowledge that you don't know that the newer things exist because there's not enough advertising or anything. Yeah, I mean, I think even if, even if everyone had perfect knowledge, um, you know, uh, economists might imagine that, um, or, or maybe the old things uh, wouldn't be produced anymore because you could put those resources to producing more of the newer things and, and stuff like that. So it's not, um, you're never like, uh, having resources go unused, they're always put towards kind of whatever the best best purpose is in, in, in a kind of like an optimal economy, and then everything else is kind of friction, like the, like the stuff Richard's talking about. And, um, yeah, so I think I think that's kind of that's kind of a little bit what uh, what say is imagining here is that um, is that the resources are uh, minus the disruptions and frictions and stuff like that. The resources are are going to tend toward being put to their full use uh, because people trade for the things they want. Uh, and if they're not trading for something, then that means they want something else and it all adjusts. Yeah. And then there's places like Ocean State Java where the things that people don't want to buy are lower to enough, prices are lower enough that they, people actually want to buy them or they just sit there for long, for long enough that people want to buy them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, and, and that's an example of you know prices going down until until everything sells. But I would imagine that the producers who produce that stuff, um, they are not making a profit on those sales. They're maybe just recouping some of what they lost by those products not selling at full price. So it's not going to be the case that they're going to go out there and produce more of these things because they know it's going to eventually be sold at a discount at Ocean State Job Lot, right? Uh, so, so yeah, uh, you could imagine that if there was generalized deflation throughout the economy, then you can, you know, like, oh, everything's going to sell. But again, it's the, it's, you know, like, if you're selling for, for, you know, 10 cents on the dollar or something like that, a dollar is still a dollar in this case. This, this particular producer uh, is in some trouble. Yeah. Um, and then the example Michael brings up is like when tractors were invented, horses didn't need to be bought and sold as much. And I think that's, that's also an example of a reallocation of resources, right? Um, you know, like, uh, maybe we didn't have as many horses, but we put the resources that went into horses into, into other things. And, and to some extent, in the long run, uh, Say's law does hold to some extent. Um, but I would argue that, that a big part of the reason why it holds is that we're finding ways uh, to activate the demand to, to meet the supply. So supply, in a sense, is creating its own demand, but it's not just doing it on its own. It's doing it because we're saying, hey, there's, you know, there's resources here. Uh, we need to find ways to put money into people's hands so they can buy these things. Yeah. And, and I think you know, basic income is kind of the, the extreme end of that. If we give everyone a basic income, then Say's law becomes true. It becomes like really, really true. Uh, you know, like any time the economy is able to produce more, we increase the basic income so people can buy the stuff. Now, Say's law is 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 a, a real thing. Yeah. Uh, so Tommy said, or you don't have to use more. You just have to use those supplies more wisely. Like you can yeah. irradiate bread to kill all the mold and things in it, and so you can last for months instead of just a week. Yeah. And so why people are well against that sort of thing because they're afraid that oh, I could get it irradiated or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that there. Well, I think there's there's a few things here. Like, uh, basic income isn't going to prevent people from kind of uh, being irrational and not buying things that would actually benefit them and or not paying yeah, for things. No like GMO that. foods and things. Right, like that kind of stuff. Um, but to the extent that people, um, when they have the money, they're going to buy the things they want, uh, basic income does, does help us allocate resources more efficiently. And as Richard pointed out, it's not just about necessarily uh, uh, activating unused resources, but also using existing resources, allocating those resources more effectively uh, so to get more benefit. Yeah. Uh, and Tommy says... Uh, he wants to know more about the hoarding money concept. The Wikipedia article seems to be saying that he didn't uh, believe that anyone would ever hoard money. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of has to be true in order for uh, 
for his his uh, law to kind of to hold in the ideal world. I think he was imagining like, um, of course, he knew that some people were hoarding money some of the time, but I think he imagined a maximally efficient economy in which uh, that wasn't happening and that these were just inefficiencies and it wasn't like uh, a natural property of the economy that, that, that people would just accumulate money over time. I think that partly because of back then, there were so few rich people that, and there was like no middle class, that that's why he thought that that was the case. Yeah, 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 that could be part of it. Yeah, and like I found a bit in the article, so like one sentence that mentions like his, so it says like, say recognize this is a theoretical danger, but not a practical one. He did not believe that anyone would hold money for long. His own father had been bankrupted by the collapse of oh, Asignat's paper money yeah. issued after the French Revolution. Far from hoarding this depreciating asset, people were in such a rush to spend it that, quote, one might have supposed it burnt the fingers it passed through. Mm-hmm. So if you're in like a place where the money is constantly depreciating and of yeah. course people aren't hoarding it, they're like, well, I want to spend it and like exchange it for things I actually right. want. Okay. So. Yeah. Thank you for finding that. Yeah, that's interesting. I do remember that part now, uh, now that you just told me about it. Because <laughs> I'm like, I read this article yesterday and I don't remember this, so yeah. I like, went through. Yeah. And it wasn't there, it's so funny. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting how our beliefs are shaped by kind of just the what's in front of us. So he's he's creating this theory of the economy as a whole, um, but it's really it's really kind of part at least partly based on just like oh well why would anyone ever hoard money you know it can become valueless at any point um, you know why wouldn't people just use it uh, you know to facilitate exchanging goods and nothing beyond that like of course you might think that if that's if that's the experience that he had yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and sorry, just a follow-up yeah. question on that. Were, were there not as many, like, I don't know, financial instruments or other ways that people were, like, trying to save money or, or accumulate money or grow money? I'm try- I don't um, really know what the economy was People like. had wealth. I think it was largely land, uh, real right. estate. I mean, you know, there was there was gold as well, and, you know, right. kings had palaces and, and, and all of that. Um, I they think- could also invest in, like, the East India Company, and they would sit in an individual ship. But those ships can go down or whatever, and so right. all their investment can be lost instantaneously. Yeah, the the Dutch East India Company was the first uh, joint stock corporation. Interesting. So a little little factoid there. So you yeah. probably thought about like investing in something like that as not the same as hoarding money because it's producing more for the for other people. Yeah, he did believe that um, you know uh, when people saved uh, instead of hoarding money they would uh, they would invest it back into the economy. Right. And he imagined that that would support supply as yeah. well. But I guess yeah. as we've talked about now, at least now, there are so many investments that are kind of just financial inter- instrument investments. Yeah, like derivatives. And, right, yeah. so, so it's not really like turning back into something. In yeah, I mean, I like to say that if you, if you, if you believe that, that money is flowing kind of back into the economy, you have to tell me a story about what How the mechanism there. is yeah. that actually gets the money into the hands of ordinary consumers. Because you can invest all you want, and if you if you don't get me that last mile, how does it get into consumers' hands? Uh, then you're going to have a demand problem. Right, but wouldn't someone just say yeah. jobs, and then you would say like people couldn't make this profit if it was all going back to people? Or like, what would your answer be to that? Um, I mean, my answer to that would be, yeah, we do use jobs for that purpose, and that's not what jobs are for. You know, the labor market isn't supposed to be a tool for funneling money to consumers. That's a whole other we also like yeah. serfs and things like that in like Russia until 1860. Six, I think it was, and the serfs are going unpaid labor, and, and they don't. Right, but also, isn't it also true that you couldn't have this like growing wealth inequality if all of it was funneling back through jobs all the time, or am I misunderstanding that? If all of it was funneling back, or I guess a little bit could be not, and then yeah, I mean the way we make money uh, flow back to consumers through jobs is is usually not by taking it away uh, or taking all of it away from from rich people. It's usually um, by stimulating lending in the financial sector. So a lot of the a lot of people's wages are funded by debt in the private financial sector. Um, So so in that way, we're kind of creating new money to give to people. We're, we're, we're printing money and handing it out to people. We're just hiding it behind the fact that we're also handing them jobs and we're doing it in this really unstable way that's funded by private debt. And we're wasting people's time because you know, we're creating jobs to, to push money I've to heard people. Before, but I'm yeah. just trying to think through like what someone's argument would be. But anyway, that's a topic for yeah. another time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the topic is always basic income. So. Well, that's true. Yeah. Uh, uh, so a couple more comments on the live stream. Uh, 
Michael says, isn't the fact that people accumulate money maybe evidence that people want security rather than having infinite wants? Hmm. That's um, an interesting question. I think, in, I think yes, in the sense um, that economists talk about uh, people having infinite wants, uh, you know, because they are not necessarily imagining uh, that one of those wants is money or the security that comes with it or maybe even the power that comes with it, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that come with money. There's a lot, there's the potential to buy things and, and you the, know, people like to have that the potential, prestige. right? prestige. And the prestige, yeah. There's all <laughs> kinds of things that come with money. Um, but I think, you know, uh, supply-side economists and, and, and people like Say uh, are imagining that people's wants are infinite in terms of uh, material goods and services, yeah. Um, so this is kind of uh, evidence against that, yeah. Um, and then uh, Tommy says, Alex, I'm curious, instead of having a calibrated basic income, couldn't we just have a fixed basic income and let the general price level drop as society becomes uh, more efficiently productive? So uh, you, could, you could do that, um, and it would, it would have almost entirely the equivalent effect Except that your money is uh, is not able to be used as a stable standard unit of value anymore. Um, so your money kind of stops working as well uh, as it needs to. And there's also some differences too in that uh, money you got earlier is worth more uh, than money you got. Like you, if you hold, there's an incentive to kind of hold on to money more. So there's there's some interesting things there. I think it's more. Efficient uh, to uh, allow the price level to remain stable and just increase the basic income over time, because then then money, um, the value of money remains consistent, uh, prices can remain consistent, uh, and you don't have to like worry about these other things like uh, you know money getting more valuable and, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, Richard. In Japan, they actually try to incentivize um, spending by increasing the like the what is it sales tax over time and so you know that the sales tax is going to go up at such and such a date so right before then the bunch, a bunch of people like sell try to buy stuff so that it can take advantage of the lower sales tax yep yep there's various things like that that we can use to get people to spend more uh or spend less um i think the the most straightforward way to um, to kind of like adjust people's spending in like the short term to like uh, make adjustments to changes in the markets, changes in people's preferences, uh, stuff like that is, is monetary policy. Um, so if you adjust, in, if you're the uh, central bank, the Fed, and you adjust interest rates, um, then that can allow you uh, to modulate very kind of, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say precise, yeah, precisely modulate the level of spending in the economy to keep prices stable. Um, and I think you know over the long over the long run, you want to gradually increase the basic income so people are generally able to buy everything the economy can produce. But as as Tommy's pointing out in his uh, next comment, he's saying uh, he would expect people's preferences to change over time with respect to hoarding money. Sometimes they feel like saving. Sometimes people feel like spending. Uh, and that's obviously you know no big deal if it's you know people, if it's just random and people are canceling each other out. But sometimes everybody feels like spending more. Everybody feels like saving more. Or or you know, in aggregate or something like that, uh, and that's when you would, you would want monetary policy to step in and kind of kind of push in the other direction. So if people are wanting to spend too much, uh, you raise interest rates. Now it's harder uh, for people and businesses to borrow money, so that makes it harder uh, for people to get money to spend, and it, and it and it keeps the spending in check. And then the other the other direction uh, when people aren't spending enough, um, if over like I was saying, if over the long run. Uh, people are consistently not spending enough uh, and you don't want interest rates to get too low so that you, you don't want like asset bubbles and, and you know booms and busts and things like that. You gradually increase the basic income to, to, to fill out the, the, the spending potential that the economy has uh, to activate the, the supply. Yeah. Um, David Adkins says, how do you get money into people's hands? Earn it through any kind of how do you get money into people's hands? Earn it through any kind of productive behavior. Um, so I think that's that's kind of what we typically expect. Um, that's kind of you know the standard expectation is that the way people get money is by producing something, by selling their labor, that kind of thing. Um, it can be tricky uh, 
you can't uh, you can't necessarily do that uh, in a way that gives people sufficient income to uh, reap the full benefit of what the economy is capable of providing them. Uh, so if in, in an efficient labor market, um, jobs only exist because we actually want the product of the labor. There's demand for that. And then the only purpose of wages is to provide an incentive uh, for people to perform that labor. There's no law of economics that says that efficient wages will, will adjust uh, to give people enough money to buy, buy everything the economy wants to produce for them. Uh, and a big part of that has to do with, well, I mean, it has to do with a lot of factors. Um, but it's the answer to the question of how to get money into people's hands, um, you know, we're in a basic income discussion group, and I would say, you know, the answer is basic income. You know, that's the kind of like the simplest way to get money into their hands. And, and you, can, you can kind of see that um, there are some negative consequences to us lacking an efficient mechanism to get money into people's hands. Uh, and one of the most obvious ones is that we try to stimulate employment. You know, we create jobs because we want people to have money, or we have minimum wage because we feel like workers need money, you know, that kind of thing. But these things all run counter to having an efficient labor market that, that, that's, that's only about allocating the resource of labor efficiently. Um, so, you know, the labor market's not supposed to be a tool for funneling money to consumers, um, you know, or we use, you know, in combination with that, we use monetary policy to, to create money, but then that has a side effect of asset bubbles, you know, like we saw that, you know, in the 2008 crash, that kind of thing. If you have a basic income that's calibrated to the productive capacity of the economy, uh, then you're not going to have uh, recessions that are caused solely by problems in financial markets anymore. Because if you think about what a, what a recession is, is it's a, uh, a contraction in the production, in the economy's production. And the economy's production is not going to contract if people have a steady source of income to spend on, on the economy's output, right? So it's, um, you know, in most of the recessions we've had, you know, uh, Great Depression, uh, you know, 2008 crash, you know, there hasn't been, uh, you know, the first thing that happened wasn't like a real hit to the economy's productive capacity. We didn't like lose factories. It wasn't like all our workers died or, you know, something like that. It was, you know, there were problems in financial markets. Uh, people didn't have enough money to spend. Then capacity went underutilized. Then we lost real capacity. You know, if we get hit by an asteroid or something, you know, and that, and that kills our capacity, then we might still have a recession, even if we have a basic income. Uh, but that's, that's nothing you can really kind of prevent. Or yeah. what happened in the, it's happening in the Rust Belt, where the tariffs are killing off the necessity for production because they can't get people to buy things. So all these jobs and factories and things are being lost. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I think that's a really good point. Um, it's uh, can you say that again? I started he, thinking. I think it. he was saying that like if with tariffs, people the demand oh, for the products are lower. Yeah, so so tariffs are really are a really good example because the whole reason we have tariffs in the first place, or a big part of it, is because we want to protect jobs, and we want to protect jobs. Oops. Should not touch that. We want, to, we want to protect. We want to protect jobs because we're trying to get uh, incomes to workers. We're trying to get money to consumers. So this is another example of the kinds of inefficiencies that we introduce that are a consequence of us not having an efficient way to get money to consumers. And then Tommy made a comment: uh, invested money goes into Amazon's infrastructure, which goes into the hands of a consumer named Jeff Bezos. <laughs> last mile accomplished. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, anyone have any comments before we get to the next quote? I was kind of. We're still on the same along. quote, right? Uh, we we did two quotes actually. Uh, <laughs> but I, when I went to let go to the bathroom, there did we skip quotes? Uh, we didn't do anything since we went to the bathroom. Right. We did a couple quotes before you got here. Right. Uh, so so this was from the beginning. Say at first denied that a general glut could exist. Some goods can be oversupplied, he conceded, but goods in general cannot. His reasoning became known as Say's law. It's production, which opens a demand for products. Or in later, snappier formulation, supply creates its own demand. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the introduction. Uh, and then I guess we didn't get to this quote. Uh, so this proposition, he admitted, has a paradoxical complexion which creates pre a prejudice against it. To the modern ear, it sounds like the foolhardy belief that if you build it, they will come. Rick Perry, America's energy secretary, was ridiculed 
after a recent visit to West Virginia coal plant for saying, you put the supply out there and the demand will follow. Wait, so, oh, go ahead, yeah. I mean, so basically he's saying, if you mine more coal, then, you know, people are going to be like, yay, coal, and want to buy all that coal. That's what he's saying. So I feel like this is a little unfair to say, though, even though I right. don't really agree with say, because he, now we're talking about specific industries. And he's trying yes. to make an argument about the economy. And as a the, whole. the article is actually bringing this up as something that's unfair to say. I see it because it's talking about a, a specific industry. Right. You um, could still think that like the price of coal would drop enough, maybe that it would get a demand. But then the coal people might not be so happy about that either. Right. But this is the example of you know like the, it's kind of like the Ocean State job lot yeah, exactly. where, where you know Ocean State job lot for coal where like the coal yeah. producers <laughs> a, a dollar is still a dollar and they're not getting enough dollars to sustain their no, operations. No, I, I agree. Yeah. That's what I was saying. But yeah. the second part of my point. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. Um, and Tommy says we end up treating employment as something we need to stimulate for ethical humanitarian reasons, but uh, digging holes and filling them back up again. Uh, yeah, and I think that's right. Uh, but if we think of jobs as the way people get their money, then um, it is humanitarian to create jobs, right? Because now you're now you're providing people with a livelihood. Uh, so you know that's kind of uh, the the connection that we need to unbundle a little bit in order to be able to to uh, think about something like basic income in a way that makes sense. Yeah, like today, a federal jobs guarantee, a poll came up for federal, federal jobs guarantee and 78% of Americans support no. <laughs> Wow. But yeah, yeah, it makes total sense according to what Alex is, like that's how we think of people as getting their money yeah. and it doesn't seem fair that people can't even get the access to the way to get money. Right, yep. For sure, yeah, I understand that. You guys ready for another one? I am. This is just the next paragraph. To grasp Say's point requires two intellectual jumps. The first is to see past money, which can obscure what's really going on in an economy. The second is to jump from micro to macro, from a worm's eye view of individual plants and specific customers to a panoramic view of the economy as a whole. And this is the point that you're bringing up. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if you look at, you know, the coal mine, just the coal miners alone, you know, you can't just... You know, Say's law isn't saying that everyone is going to want coal. He's saying that everyone is going to want stuff, and that if you produce stuff that people want, people are going to want to buy yeah. it. You yeah. can also turn coal into oil and things like that, like the Germans did during World War II because they ran out of oil. They turned coal into oil? Mm -hmm. Huh. Or they used coal... Instead of oil? They converted no, their... They, they like used a chemical process to turn it into oil. That's huh. really interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Um, and how the Americans, because they ran out of rubber, created synth synthetic rubber during World War II. I think I have heard of that, yeah. Because the Japanese are like, mm. hmm. Yeah, but I mean the, yeah, these are these are all examples of kind of kind of reallocating resources. Um, and yeah, I mean like to I, I think Bethany's point is right, that we're not being fair to say if uh, if we're only looking at a, a particular a particular product, um, the first part though, the part about seeing past money, I think you know, if we ignore money, then then we miss uh, the effects of a lot a lot of the stuff I was talking about. You can't just ignore money. Uh, you know, say thought of it as, and a lot of economists kind of abstract away from money and kind of their models of the economy, um, and they just assume that it's this thing that makes the economy go. Um, and it is this thing that makes the economy go, but in order for it to make the economy go properly, it has to be a stable standard unit of value. And in order for it to be a stable standard unit of value, there are constraints on how prices can adjust in the economy. Um, and then Tommy says coal liquefaction for, for what? Right, Richard, in Richard, reference Richard, to the oil Richard. stuff. Yeah. Um, it's liquefaction. Oh, liquefaction. Liquefaction. I think I have heard that word before. <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, can a uh, can a perfect like a, a barter utopia exist or succeed? It does in Path of Exile. Uh, my answer to that question is going to be no. That that such a thing has never existed and could never exist even in theory, uh, because as soon as you start scaling up an economy, you need money to facilitate trade, and then that money has to be stable. Um, so you can't, 
once money is in the picture, you can't abstract away from it. And once you have large scale trade, you have to have money because otherwise you run into like this huge computational complexity problem where you know all the prices have to be calculated in terms of each other and that kind of thing. Okay, well I'm thinking of some sort of eBay of barter where you, you know, type in what you have and what you want. Everybody in the world does that. And then the, the supercomputer uh, connects everybody up. Yeah, there is a thing like that in my, in my you, UI play. Have you heard of, do you know the economist uh, Leon Walrus? Hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of what, what he talks about, where you have like, uh, you know, everybody says what their prices are, but you know, if, relative to each other. Even if that was happening, I'd have to think about how, like, I have to make sure to have on hand a toaster that I can then later trade when I want some dress, and I have to make sure the toaster is enough of the dress, and pretty soon, well, I really, like, even super, if a computer is mediating it. You I don't have to have a toaster on hand. You can have whatever you want, whatever you have on hand, on hand, and then the computer trades your you know, whatever for a toaster. But can for I the, set, yeah. send a toaster and a half in? Or like, I, I need to send can, something in send, to get something out. You can else. send a toaster and a bike helmet to it's get a toaster so and a bike helmet. It's just so much worse than money, like so obviously to me. Like I have to keep track of I mean, it is, but helmet. let's take this thought experiment to right. its extreme. Let's say you could do that. Whatever you happen to have, you put it in and, you know, the computer will figure out, you know, where it goes to, to get uh, whatever, uh, whatever what it is that I you want. What am I paid an income in, if anything, toasters? Your 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 you, pay, you trade your thing. Your thing might be labor, right? You you trade whatever your thing to get whatever thing you want, right? You have like in Lord of War, the guy who received like diamonds and thing, and like. But pretty so quickly, I'm whatever. gonna want. Yeah. Time ahead. delay, so there's gonna be money automatically because the computer will like coin that basically as some kind of value that I can then spend later. Well, let's even imagine. So let's let's be as charitable to this scenario as possible. Right. And let's imagine that everybody wants to trade at exactly the same time. Everybody has something to trade now and wants something now. So let's make these I, admittedly unrealistic assumptions, but let's even make these assumptions. Now you have a supercomputer that's crunching the numbers and figuring out what everyone needs. I said before that this is a computational complexity problem. Right. Now we're literally talking about a computer. And if you actually did this, the computer would not be able to handle it because this is not a, a problem that can, that can be solved efficiently. At, at any large scale, unless you have some kind of common denominator, some kind of currency. The, the computer will invent it. money if it has a learning algorithm. Won't if it? the computer has a learning algorithm, it'll learn that this is really stupid and <laughs> it'll create some kind of money internal right. to itself. It'll figure out yeah. what the units are yeah. worth to each other and it'll right. create yeah. a money unit and then it'll yes. use the money unit to do the task for you. That is exactly But then right. humans would still rather know about the money unit explicitly, I think, because then, like I said, they could wait, have time delays, and they wouldn't have to think about yep. how much they're going to be, they wouldn't have trouble predicting how much they're going to get for things. And All of your points are correct. That would be my sense. It'd be <laughs> yeah, hard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you have a cow, and you want to trade it. Yeah. But, well, if you want, if you wanted, if you needed a lot of stuff, you would have to specify the price of all the things you want in terms of your cow. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, it, yeah the, the combinatorial problem just in one household of all the things they have, yeah. all the things they want. Totally. So hard, right? Each have yeah. to be converted exactly. into each other. Right. Yep. In Before uh, the computer. Next mm -hmm. now, they, they are a few key currency items, like there's forms of alchemy, there's chaos orbs, and uh, there, for like really big ticket purchases, there's a, there's a exalted orbs which are like over a <coughs> hundred chaos orbs each. So, <laughs> so Tommy is bringing up uh, an interesting story. Uh, I think this, I think he's talking about the island of Yap in the South Pacific. Uh, so he says apparently there was a primitive society at one point uh, where their money was measured as equity ownership of, of particular beautiful boulders in the community. Huh. They just remembered how much everyone owned. They didn't shatter the boulders into pieces and carry them around. They just carried <coughs> them around. Yeah, and I think there was an, uh, an issue where they were, they, they, occasionally they would carry them around. They would transport them from island to island or, you know, like if there was a big transaction, they would move move one of these big things from one person's yard to another person's yard. They were big rocks with holes through them, so I think that, that allowed them to carry carry them. They drilled holes through them. Uh, and there was one time where one of, these, one of these big boulders, one of these big rocks was on a ship, and the ship sank. So they had to argue about 
um, whether that was still money in the money supply. And they decided that it was. Even though and they it's just, down there? Yeah, they just <laughs> traded uh, ownership you know, of this right. thing on the bottom of the ocean and they yeah. still had equity in it and you know, they still used it as money. Yeah, yeah that's funny. Uh, yeah. That's really good. Uh, so it's just really an interesting, interesting story. Yeah. yeah. I hope they invented the wheel too. I mean, if they were rolling, rolling these boulders yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I, you know, like I'm, I, I'm imagining pictures of them, and, and I'm imagining them as like round slabs with holes in the middle. So they were almost wheels already. Yeah. Like the yeah. Wheels. yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. There. Uh, I guess there was never an actual barter economy anywhere. No. It was always like this. It was mm -hmm. a unwritten. Uh, a system of social credit that people just yeah. Track yeah. yeah. There, so there were there are specific instances where barter emerges, and that's usually when two cultures meet each other and they don't know how to price anything, and then that's when barter happens. Yeah, uh, that's kind of where I was going. What about, about different currencies? Like about cows, five dollars in the U.S., but three euros in I don't know France. Like, like how does that, how does that kind of work out from like a? Because it seems like all these scenarios we're just talking about one universal money right um so can you kind of talk about how the value between currencies ties in? yeah so so one universal uh money is kind of like the ideal for an ideal economy but of course we have all these different currencies uh and you might think that um you know uh euros are able to buy a certain amount of stuff in europe and dollars are able to buy a certain amount of stuff here and then you would just look at oh well what euros can buy versus what dollars can buy and then that would be the exchange rate but that's not actually how it works. That's called that's called purchasing power parity. But that's not how the the values of currency interrelate with each other. Because you look at you know you look at the charts and they're like bouncing all around all the time. It's not like this this stable thing. And there's there's some connection there, but it's not entirely that. Um, and you know the differences can have to do with with interest rates. If there's two currencies that are you know just working in their economies and then one of them pays a higher interest rate, people are going to be like, oh, I want I want the one that pays the higher interest rate and that'll cause flows in one direction. So there's all kinds of crazy stuff that happens uh, in, in like the foreign exchange markets and stuff like that. Gosh. Um, but there's no simple there's no simple rule for how to translate one currency and another. It has to do with like the different countries' monetary policies. And it's also more about um, how they're changing relative to each other than just like what the actual exchange rates are in any given moment. Because if we have, you know, the dollar and then say the, uh, you know, 100 yen is a dollar or something like that, and that was just stable, then that would be pretty straightforward. But it's not, it's not like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm trying to get rid of money. Because, are you? Are you? Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> what, what people... Yeah, here. <laughs> Jimmy. <laughs> the, whole, the whole concept. Um, because it doesn't seem to matter uh, what people make or do, uh, it seems to matter what, you know, the foreign, what foreign exchange rates are and what, uh, you know, the, the IMF and the World Bank and the, uh, the BIS and all of that. And well, in this country, it, it sort of matters, uh, I mean, what the Fed decides to make interest rates seems to matter way more than what any of the actual workers or businessmen do. So it seems like, um, and these are even the well-meaning people with money. Then there's the, um, you know, not well-meaning hedge funds, speculative currency attacks, and all that. Yeah. Um, which seems to be uh, seem to be problems of pure money, regardless of what anybody makes or buys or sells. I think that though Alex would say that the interest rates are serving a valuable function for the rest of us because they're keeping the currency useful. And stable, which has all these other functions. Well, I, I mean, but I think that you'd rather have a basic income. I mean, isn't that kind of what you say? Uh, not exactly. I, I think what Steve, what you're saying is that you know interest rates seem to have more effect on the value of currency than anything anyone else does. Hmm. Well, or on the just on the value of uh, everybody's material life. Yeah, like their wealth. The value of everyone's material life. Mm, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I think you get interest rates wrong, and that certainly hurts everyone. Uh, you get you get your monetary policy and your economic policy wrong, and people suffer. Uh, if you lack an efficient mechanism for getting money to people's hands, there's unnecessary poverty, there's unnecessary make work, that kind of thing. Um, but I don't think it's the case that people's work doesn't matter, and I don't think it's the case that the real resources in the economy don't matter, because if we didn't have those, we wouldn't have the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's very important, too. Uh, and I think it's money's job to get out of the way. 
uh, or to to not be the source of, of, of problems. So you want it to be stable. You want it to be uh, serving its purpose. You don't want it to be the constraint on what people have. Right. Which is uh, maybe part of... What and, and you don't want volatility in money making it harder for people to trade with each other and that kind of thing. Uh, you don't want too much inflation, deflation, all of that. Right. So you just want it to like work in a seamless way that allows right. things to work. And Michael brings up the point, uh, wouldn't a global currency be more efficient? And, and yeah, I mean, the answer is yes. In, in the ideal, you know, we have a global economy, um, you know, the most efficient thing would be for us all to be trading in the same currency. Um, but in order to achieve that, you need to have institutions at the global level, uh, right? You need to have a global government. Right. Uh, and that's not something that's easy to do and not something that's desirable for uh, a lot of people and for various reasons. Right? And that like, you get into the discussion we've had before about efficiency versus like robustness. Yeah, do you want a single point of failure right. uh, in your in your global institutions? Yeah. And maybe the answer is yes for some things. Maybe the, the efficiency is worth it for, right. for you know, to have a... Yeah. To have a currency that that um, that facilitates trade in this way, but it's not it's not an easy an easy thing to do. And even if someone decided that that was what they wanted, you know, like we need cooperation uh, in order to make that happen. Yeah, is that what Facebook was kind of going for with Libra? Okay, sort of a quasi global currency. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. And and even before that, PayPal. Uh, when PayPal first started, they wanted to create a global currency uh, to you know. You know, they had that. They had that vision. It's not an easy thing to make happen, though. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so Tommy says uh, that's partly why I suggested eliminating monetary policy and just having a fixed basic income. It seems like it eliminates a policy decision that could be subject to corruption or incompetence. So I mean, I think I think that's a, an interesting point. Um, it's important to remember, that, though, that, that lack of monetary policy is a monetary policy. So when you say eliminate monetary policy, uh, what does that mean? Do you, what do you want interest rates to be? Do they fly all over the place? Um, do they, you know, like, there's a lot of volatility that happens in the economy. Um, you know, if you just keep interest rates at zero, for example. <laughs> Tell me on to you, Alex, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if Sorry, you Andrew. yeah if you just allow interest rates to be at zero for example then um, you know you're gonna have you're gonna have uh, credit expansions unstable private credit there's gonna be kind of this this money printing phenomenon in the private financial sector and the way we prevent that instability is by raising interest rates um, if you get rid of of the institutions if you get rid of the central bank uh, what's gonna happen is their other banks are going to be creating the money, just as they did, you know, like before there really were central banks. Uh, and then one of those banks is going to become powerful and kind of become the de facto central bank. A central bank will like emerge. Like the Bank of England. Like the Bank of England did. The Bank of England was not always a central bank. It was it was just the biggest uh, private commercial bank, uh, and the other the rest of the banking system depended on the Bank of England in order to to function and the Bank of England depended on the economy as a whole being stable, financial markets being stable, uh, in order to be profitable. So they fell into the role of, of, of managing uh, the economy's monetary policy. You can't, um, you can't eliminate monetary policy because monetary policy will emerge, I guess is the answer. Yeah. And, and monetary policy will emerge largely because uh, we do need a stable currency. Uh, a stable, stable currency and stable financial markets are, are, are necessary for a well-functioning economy. So if we, if we lack that, um, we will come up with a way to find that or to make that happen. Uh, so, so it's, you'd have to, in order to let the currency um, just to, uh, appreciate or allow deflation to happen, it would have to be an explicit uh, decision, then you'd have to have a way of preventing uh, someone else from coming in and, and doing better because a stable currency is is better for the markets. Yeah. Um, let's see. Anyone have any more comments before the next quote? Um, firms like coal plants and cotton mills sell their products for money. 
but in order to obtain that money, their customers must themselves have previously sold something of value. Thus, before they can become a source of demand, customers must themselves have been a source of supply. Of course, this is no longer true if you have a basic income. Or if you invest in monetary instruments and things like that. Right. Oh, actually, let me not talk about that here. <laughs> Sorry, I had to plug in my laptop. Um, it's also not true if people are borrowing in order to be able to spend. Right. Rather than being a source of su supply, they're maybe promising that they will be a source of supply at some time in the future. Yeah. So it can go in the other direction. Uh, or, or you can imagine you know, this mechanism happening the other way because I'm saying in the future I'm gonna be able to sell things, therefore let me borrow money, and now I buy the thing, uh, and now that person has money, now there's more money out there, and now the economy is able to buy the thing that I promised I was going to be able to sell in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like the people, the people borrowing the money and spending the money is what allows them to pay back the debt. So it can happen in that order too. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Perry Merling likes to say that um, economics is about talking about uh, how uh, previous work and, and resource usage have led to uh, what we have now. And then finance is about how promises about the, what the future will bring uh, lead to what we have now. So you can think about it from either of these directions. And both are true. Yeah. Perry Merling is the guy who teaches the Economics of Money and Banking course on Coursera. Which is amazing. Uh, yeah, Rob. Um, <clears throat> would all loans be considered risk-free? And I guess sales model, like if you, if I had money, you wanted to start something, I gave you money, you built your company because you now have supply, therefore there's demand. It's risk-free theoretically. There's never you're not going to default because there's going to be. I think demand that comes back to buy. like the fact that he's talking about the economy as a whole. But individual ventures can still fail, right? Because okay. he must have seen that happen over and over again, like, with like yeah. the ship American sinking thing. and stuff. But but not. I mean, ship sinking is different from what you were saying. But I think I think he would say like in individual cases it can happen, but just okay. not across the board. Like he mentioned South America having yeah. a bunch of failed ventures there. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Would you say the same thing, Alex? Oh, uh, as what I just said. I mean, I was agreeing with what you were saying that it, yeah, that it's individual it's, versus the whole. Right. Yeah. I mean, it certainly, in, even under Say's law, individual businesses can fail, individual ventures can fail, but yeah. the economy as a whole uh, would not. Okay. And and again, he's again he's saying right. ideally that the economy tends toward uh, uh, a state where um, all of the supply is is creating demand for itself. But he's also admitting that there are various disruptions along the way. Yeah. I'm saying that it doesn't even tend toward that state, that that's not where it's going. Yeah. It's not just about disruptions. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Tommy is bringing in an interesting quote from Wikipedia. Followers of Say's law would argue that on the aggregate level, there is only a transactions demand for money. There is no precautionary finance or speculative demand for money. So this kind of comes back to the thing where we're talking, where he's thinking of money as just this thing that facilitates, um, yeah, facilitates the trade that that's going to happen, makes it more efficient, uh, and and you don't really want to pay attention to it beyond that. So, and I think he would imagine that investment, um, in particular, maybe it takes the form of money in a, in a particular situation, but he's still probably thinking of investment in real terms. Like we're investing resources in yeah. building capacity to produce uh, goods and services. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting quote. You guys ready for another one? Tommy, uh, yeah, I am. Pull it along. That supply creates demand in this way must be uh, that supply creates demand in this way may be easy enough to grasp, but in what what sense does supply create its own demand? This is kind of what you were talking about. The epigram seems to suggest that a coal plant could buy its own coal, like a subsistence farmer eating the food he grows. In fact, of course, most producers sell to and buy from someone else. But what is true at the micro level is not true at the macro level. At the macro level, level, there is no someone else. The economy is an integrated whole. What it purchases and distributes among its members are the self-same goods and services 
that those members have jointly produced. At this level of aggregation, the economy is in fact not that different from the subsistence farmer. What it produces, what it earns, and what it buys is all the same, a harvest of goods and services, better known as gross domestic product. So this is just your yeah, point right. being made in the article. Uh, and I think this is true. Uh, I, I think the thing that's not true is that uh, we will necessarily harvest it all um, automatically without uh, without something like a basic income. Yeah, place. I guess that it like depends on whether you're considering like what the equilibrium state is, which is like not producing more than people are buying versus the capacity that you could have. Like, could you be producing more if people right. were going to buy more? And, and Say is saying that the economy tends toward a state where you couldn't be producing more. Right. But that, I think, but the way that they put it here, what it purchases and distributes among its members are the self-same goods and services that they have produced. Mm -hmm. That just describes the state that we're going to be in because you don't want to produce something that goes to waste. But well, it, that's always going to be true. Right. So, But that's yeah. not really getting at the heart of Says well, at least that sentence isn't. This is just getting to the part, to the kind of the point that you were making. Yeah, that he's thinking from a macro level instead of individual you, he's markets not or individual producers. They're not getting yeah. into that part of it yet. Right. Yeah. Okay. There's also like renewable energy, like tidal power and wind and solar and things, but that we could access, but we don't have, we don't have the incentive or whatever to do. So. Yeah. I, I mean. Um, I don't know. I don't know uh, about the specifics of those things, but I do know that um, there are a lot of things that would benefit people that that people don't have because they don't have the money to, to buy them, uh, or yeah. yeah, and that can be true. That's true. You know, in general, as a society as a whole, there there are probably plenty of things that we that we would be producing for ourselves uh, if the economy worked more efficiently. Yeah. Ready for another one? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is an example. This is uh, following an example where they have uh, uh, too many too many shoes being uh, produced and not enough hats being produced, and the shoemakers and the cobblers are trying to, to buy each other's each other's goods. Uh, so Say believed uh, a happier outcome was possible in a free market. He thought shoe prices would quickly fall and hat prices rise. This would encourage shoe consumption and hat production, even as it discouraged the consumption of hats and the production of shoes. As a result, both cobblers and hat hatters might sell $90 of their good, allowing the economy to reach its $180 potential. In short, what the economy required was a change in the mix of GDP, not a reduction in its level. Or as one intellectual ally put it, production is not excessive, but merely ill-assorted. Uh, so I think this is just um, I think this is this is generally true. If you have too much production of one thing and not enough production of something else, then the prices adjust and the production can adjust. Yeah. Um, but if you have uh, and and he's imagining that that it always works like this. That too much of one thing always means not enough of something else. Um, and and I think that's that's not true in general. Like you could have a situation where. There are too many hats and too many shoes, uh, and you can't solve it by, by producing less of one and more of the other. Either you produce less of both, or you find a way to boost demand. Yeah. But I guess so they're still not really getting at why he thinks the whole economy works like that. I mean, if you dig deep enough, I don't think you're necessarily going to be able to have an answer um, if you imagine an economy without money, like if you start by thinking of money as just this, this uh, transactional thing that just facilitates transactions, and you never imagine that money is going to be hoarded, um, you know, they talked about seeing past money. He was seeing past money, but then he was also uh, seeing past um, the thing that would, would potentially uh, point him in another direction on this. You know what I mean? That's fair. I guess yeah. what I come back though again to the when I was making about selling labor. Like yeah. if all the goods can be produced, let's even get rid of money again. But like if all the goods can be produced by a few factories by by like a small person owned by a small percentage of the population, yeah, and they don't really need to employ very many people, 
then it doesn't seem like his way of thinking about things really works. So he has these sort of like two evenly situated people who make shoes or hats, but that's not necessarily how things work at all. Um, in the sense that there might be people who, like we said, labor their labor is not is not wanted. Um, at the level that you would want that they could. Be yeah, wanted. I mean, I, I think he is, like we said, he's imagining a world in which. Um, everyone does have the option of producing something that other people will want. That he, He's assuming that, that that's going to be true. And this is the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution, so he's lived through a time, or you know, it's very recent that there was a time when you know, it was pre-Industrial Revolution, and everyone was kind of contributing something valuable, right? Or, or they could decide to if they wanted to. Uh, and you know, there was also, you know, um, serfdom and, you know, uh, that kind of uh, hierarchical structure, you know, uh, you know, wasn't quite, he's also imagining a free market. And, 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 and it's important to recognize that, I think at this time, you know, there never really had been such a thing as a free right. market. Like, this is Pretty a new radical. thing. I, I think that's really interesting yeah. history, yeah. Yeah, this is kind of like Adam Smith imagined the free market. Um, you know, 30 years before this, and, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's a pretty cool thing to be, to, to be able to imagine something like this, something, you know, like an efficient system like this, right. um, that's really not how the world works, but it's like kind of this ideal of how the world could work. Um, and I think, you know, he, you know he, he got a lot of it right. Um, it's just, you know, money, and I guess money is kind of, money in the way we think of it today is, is is emerging at this time right. like you know they were still using gold and I mean like obviously there was always there was always money there was always something to facilitate trade but in terms of um, in terms of it being kept stable by institutions and managed by you know managed directly by monetary policy it used to be that you know society was small scale enough that you just find something that people generally value the same amount that seemed pretty stable and you'd use that as your money. And, you know, that ran into problems, you know, like suddenly there's uh, an influx of gold and silver from Latin America and then you have inflation and everyone's like, what's happening? And I thought, you know, gold is worth, you know, <laughs> what it was worth, but no, not so much. Right. Um, but, the, you know, people had to actually do research and demonstrate that that inflation was a real thing. I think I read um, read something about this guy who was... Uh, I think he worked in a, a monastery or was a monk or something like that. And he was, he was reading old manuscripts and, um, you know, noticing what prices were like hundreds of years ago. And he's like, oh, they're not the same as they are now. This is like, this is like a thing. And he like brought it to people's attention. And right. like, you know, this was something that had to be demonstrated that this, that this, this could happen. And there's another yeah. guy who uh, checked out the, the um, metal content of coins over time and seeing how the value changed with that. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, there's a there's a great book. Um, it's called the the Big Problem of Small Change uh, by uh, Thomas R. Belt and some other guy. But they talk about you know like how it, it took a long time for us to figure out how to create different denominations of of coins without there being shortages of certain denominations at all times. Like this was like. This is like something that took us a really long time to figure out. We didn't figure it out until maybe like uh, the the late nineteenth century or early twentieth right. century. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, so there 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 like we talked about before. There are things that always have to be true. Like we always have to find a currency or something like that. But we didn't know why why this stuff worked or how this stuff work stuff worked, and we didn't know how to make it work as efficiently as possible. We had to develop you know monetary policy, and we had to we had to figure out that that. You know, all currency is fiat currency, and, and the proper way to manage it is to is to anchor it against a, a basket of consumer goods because that's what currency is, and you know that kind of thing. Yeah. We had to we had to learn this. Cool. Uh, so we it, it's kind of like the stuff Bethany uh, talks about with cultural learning. Like we do these things, and we don't know why they work, um, right. but if we learn why they work, we can we can do make them better. better. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Um, how did, uh, so Tommy is saying, wait, how do they solve the coin denomination uh, shortage problem? <laughs> I'm not going to be able to give you as good of an answer as the book did, uh, but I can say that in general, the way they did it was they made smaller denomination coins have uh, 
less of a uh, less of the precious metal in them. So the smaller denomination coins uh, were never going to be something that people would want to hoard. Uh, they, by law, by fiat, they you know you you had to be able to exchange them and 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 accept them as payment. Um, but uh, people, you know, uh, they would kind of stay in circulation because pe people would just keep spending them because if they wanted to save money, they they'd have the real the real big gold coins and they weren't that big, but you know. Uh, I, I think that was the main solution, but they have like some kind of formula in there, and, and if you're really curious, I would, I would check out the book. Uh, the Big Problem, Small Change. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone have any comments or thoughts before the next quote? Next quote. quote. Yeah. Next quote. <laughs> I love the progress I'm making. Yeah. yeah. Uh, supply gives people the ability to buy the economy's output, but what ensures their willingness to do so? According to the logic of Say and his allies, people would not bother to produce anything unless they intended to do something with the proceeds. Why suffer the inconvenience of providing $100 worth of labor unless something of equal value was sought in return? Even if people chose to save, not consume the proceeds, Say was sure the savings would translate faithfully into investments in new capital, like his own cotton factory. And that kind of investment, say knew all too well, was a voracious source of demand for men and materials. Yeah. He only had his cotton factory for like four years before he gave up on it. <laughs> That's true. It was too voracious. <laughs> I think it was much more lucrative for him. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, he's, he's making some assumptions here, but I think he's getting certain things right, which is that... Um, you know, when people do invest, what you're invest you're, when you're investing, you're, you're you're paying people to build, you know, to build your capacity, to to to, to build your capital. Um, so that you know that kind of creates a source of demand as well, uh, even if you are not directly buying the final good. So I think he's he's right to that extent. Um, again, it's um, you know he, he doesn't. It's not telling a complete story about how it how it specifically gets back into the hands of like ordinary consumers on average throughout the economy but you can imagine how it kind of would or you can imagine that that he, he would think it kind of would what he's not conceding here or, or what it says he's not conceding here is that people would uh provide a hundred dollars worth of labor just to have a hundred dollars yeah that's what the next paragraph yeah talks about. and they talk about it as like a store of labor but i was also going to add sorry store of value yeah but Part of that could be reputational benefits too, although it's hard for people to know directly what's in your bank account. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why you have ways of, of showing off. Right, but yeah. maybe he would consider that to be then like demand for some stuff. So I think the well, I don't know how he thinks about like diamond rings that cost, you know, tons of money, versus like food. I don't know. Was De Beers around back then? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's until eighteen nineties. Oh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know what he thinks about like you could theoretically put in like tons of labor and then just use it all to buy like a diamond, versus you could use it to buy like a ton of food. I don't know how he thinks right. about demand in terms of like resources. Yeah, I mean, in, in, you know, the value, the the price that people are willing to pay for things might not line up with the amount of resources that went into it. Is that what you're saying? Totally. And the yeah. more you have um, skewed distribution of wealth, which they had back then too, yeah, the more you're gonna get like. People that not not lining up as much because people are starting to spend it. Well, there's also the whole fake it until you make it thing where you look like you're worth a million dollars until you actually are worth a million dollars. Interesting. Sometimes that's hard. Though. Yeah, I mean, so so money is definitely a thing that people want, uh, and right. and say is ignoring it to some extent, and then to some extent he's saying. You know, if you want money and you want to accumulate more of it, what you're doing is investing it so that it can grow more money, that kind of thing. And then that investment, you know, uh, leads to demand as well. Or really the, the yeah. 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 You ready for the next one? So this is really kind of what we're getting at, which is, um, but okay. what if the sought after thing was $100 itself? What if people produced goods to obtain money, not merely as a transactional device to be swiftly exchanged for other things, but as a store of value to be held indefinitely? 
A widespread propensity to hoard money posed a problem for Say's vision. It interrupted the exchange of good, the exchange of goods for goods on which his theory relied. Unlike the purchase of newly created products, the accumulation of money provides no stimulus to production, except perhaps the mining of precious metals under a gold or silver standard. And if, as he had argued, an oversupply of some commodities is offset by an undersupply of others, then by the same logic, an undersupply of money might indeed entail an oversupply of everything else. Mm-hmm. So, so if you that's be- your point. Yeah. So if you believe in Say's law, um, and but you also understand that that money is uh, a commodity that people want, is a good that people want, um, and you also understand that. Um, the creation of money can't just be doesn't just automatically adjust by the market like it has to be managed by institutions and if institutions are managing the money supply incorrectly that can result in an oversupply Uh, and an oversupply can mean there's goods that are being produced that nobody's buying uh, but will quickly adjust to that and just underproduce so an oversupply can also just mean underproduction we have an output gap yeah yeah and I guess this sort of relates to my diamond ring example, perhaps, because if they're if he's considering gold and silver coins to not really count, then I feel like a ten thousand dollar ring also doesn't really count, or also might count as hoarding money, or is it kind of like a continuum in that sense? So, what I'm imagining when he is talking about goods for goods, I think the goods he's imagining are things that you consume that you, you know, need a steady stream of in order to live your life, right. that you benefit from, and then they're gone, you need to buy more, that right. kind of thing. Um, With what you're saying, uh, Bethany, they, in India, things like that, there's a huge demand for like gold chains and things, because they, if your husband leaves you, then you can have these gold chains to fall back off on and when you sell them. For interesting, them. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's like an argument about like, like that um that like women back in the day like who collected all this like fancy jewelry it's like not that they were being just like really like oh i just want to look so vain but it's like well like this is all of your wealth and it's it's wealth that you can take with you yeah totally and that's kind of what i was saying that it's almost like a form of money in a funny way yeah Yeah. like you're storing it your money as a diamond or something like yeah yeah that's interesting and it's really interesting yeah so i guess i guess i feel like you know in terms of this theory if you have like a hundred employees produce food in your in your mill or produce cotton in your mill yeah. and that's like the labor that's supposed to balance out with a certain amount of supply but if that labor goes towards you having profit that goes towards a diamond it seems like it's not going back into like your your demand for supply at the same level Does that makes sense i mean well you paid someone for the diamonds so then maybe they demand I guess, something yeah i guess you did yeah um, i guess he thinks it comes around eventually but the thing is the person you paid for the diamond was someone who is just accumulating money selling diamonds, so. Right, he yeah. might be buying other diamonds or whatever, or, or gold right. coins. You have to tell the story, like I was saying, you have to tell the story of how it's gonna get into consumer's hands, and that includes yeah. like the poorest consumer, and it includes like the average consumer. The average consumer is not producing diamonds and selling them, yeah. 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 Um, so Tommy says, we skipped through his messages if we wanna go back. Um, so, ah. He's asking about GDP. So $180 GDP, I find it really hard to grok. What is the GDP of a subsistence farmer? Zero? When does it go above zero? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, So it is a good question. Um, I think something important to keep in mind is that uh, most of the work that people do is, you know, most of the valuable work that people do is not paid uh, and it does not show up in GDP. GDP uh, is going to measure things that are produced and sold. Um, so by the same token, there are many things that are valuable to us that we did not produce, that did not come from our work. There's also the uh, black market. It's a, there's there's the black market as well. There is the black market as well, which isn't going to show up in GDP. But you know, uh, we wouldn't be here without the sun. The sun doesn't show up in GDP. You know, so. So GDP is kind of this uh, very specific thing, and it's really something you can't measure if you don't have money. Um, if everyone's a subsistence farmer, you could come up with some calculation of how much food everyone produces and eats, and just add it all up, uh, and you could, you know, 
if nobody's spending any money, if they're just producing and eating their own food, um, you might measure it in, you know, heads of cabbage or, 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 or whatever food they're producing or something like that. You, you wouldn't measure it in dollars because uh, nobody's spending dollars. Average height um, of the population. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> average height of the population? Like how much nutrition does your population How much nutrition yeah, does like your Yeah. For the longest time, it wasn't until a few decades ago that the Dutch population actually grew substantially because they find their most of the population is now above above six feet tall yeah. and before that it was like they're like five feet three or yeah. something yeah. Yeah. so you could probably still call it gdp because they're still producing things domestically and you're adding it up you would just use a different unit uh, probably is this a good point in time to bring up what yeah. is it good hard or something about like when the target becomes when the measure becomes the target uh, I don't think it's that good, good of a time. <laughs> I guess I'm up. just thinking of it because it seems like underlying this point is the concern that like GDP doesn't necessarily capture everything and that we kind right. of make a big, like we sort of do a lot to try to target GDP as opposed to just using it as a measure. Right. That seemed like it might be subtext to the point, even though it's I not don't, the good. I mean, like, I, I think, so Goodhart's law is um, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. I don't think GDP... I think that's true for indirect things. Like if you're trying to measure something indirectly, like if you're trying to measure someone's learning through a standardized test or something right. like that, um, once you once you start administering the test and measuring that, or and, and once you start targeting the test, it ceases to be a good measure of, of learning, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of things in economics as well. I think it's true of um, labor, if you think of uh, jobs as being uh, an indication of a strong economy and then you, uh, in order to make the economy stronger, you just create jobs uh, regardless of whether they're useful, that kind of thing. Right. That's a good example of Goodhart's Law. Um, All right, maybe may good maybe good. a little bit with GDP, yeah, um, because if people are, if you're getting people to pay for things and buy things then um, that aren't actually valuable or something like that, um, that could be, that could be problematic. Um, I think GDP is tends to be a pretty good measure of what it's measuring. It's if you're trying to use GDP as a measure of like people's health and prosperity, right. um, yeah, then I think Goodhart's law is it's it's a it's a good example because you're targeting GDP and you might not be um, necessarily maximizing the well-being of society. Yeah. Uh, you it might depends not. on what you're thinking of it as a measure. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Like you, we could have double the GDP and twice the poverty. Like that's something right. that's possible, right? Um, Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient. Yeah, inequality. Um, so Tommy, and Tommy's next comment is: their labor is not wanted. Uh, in quotes, uh, I guess besides including most normal folks nowadays, thanks to automation, I guess you could say that criminals are people whose labor is not wanted. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's. Yeah. But I mean, but we use prison labor all the time. We use so there's, there's kind of <laughs> like I think I know Tommy's point is, yeah. but <laughs> they're, they're, I think I was saying like having a hard time finding a job afterwards. Yeah, like, we were really desperate. Yeah, yeah, I think Elizabeth yeah. understands that. Uh, but she's bringing up a good point, which That's is true, that yeah. uh, their labor is wanted um, to the extent that um, you can get it really cheap and really get cheap. things done that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to get right. done for so cheap. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, and I didn't mean to specifically be talking about any one group. I was just kind of give a symptom of the fact that like it's not like right. every single person's labor is always wanted at all times. And I would say the fact that um, businesses have the freedom to reject potential employees um, based on things like prior uh, criminal history, not having a college degree, you know, right. all kinds of kind of whatever they want, uh, right? Mm -hmm. um, the fact that they're able to do that suggests that in general throughout the economy, um, at least the, the type of labor in that job is, is not, you know, in high demand. It's not that scarce. Like they can find someone else to fill that job. That's kind of my point, they, yeah. Yeah, those, yeah. So they wouldn't be rejecting uh, the convict or, or the, the ex-convict if, um, if, if, if that person could do the job and they couldn't find someone else to do the job. It just seemed like a problem for Say's Law that there are like a lot of people who, you know, could be producing useful things but with their labor tech, but they're not necessarily, or like, at least he would think that they should be able to somehow. Hmm? Sell their labor for money to buy the thing, things like that. Say, think, say with that. Yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, so Tommy's next comment is, Alex is mentioning institutions emerging 
for purposes of keeping currencies stable. I think the internet and UBI will be undermining the supremacy of the institution as an effective model. What then? Um, I don't think that's true. I think you know uh, the UBI also has to be uh, administered by an institution. Um, you know the and you know having a UBI doesn't mean you can't doesn't mean that you can get away with not having stable currency and all of that stuff. So I don't I don't think the institutions are going away, and I don't think they really ever can go away. Yeah, uh, and as far as the internet goes. I don't think it changes anything. It, it, it makes communication more efficient. It makes uh, trade more efficient, um, you know, faster, uses less resources. But uh, we still need money. We still need, you know, a currency. Um, what about yeah. Bitcoin, internet money? Uh, Bitcoin is not internet, it's not money. We covered that in the early <laughs> uh, In order for Bitcoin to become a currency, um, you could imagine it happening, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you how it could happen, uh, which is the same way that, that gold became money. Bitcoin is kind of like, it's not internet money, it's kind of internet gold. Uh, so what you could do is you could say, uh, we want uh, to set our prices in Bitcoin. That means you need to keep uh, Bitcoin stable with respect to a basket of consumer goods. Uh, in order to do that, you would need to uh, do what we do with monetary policy. You need to keep the flow of spending of Bitcoin so that it matches the, the production of, of consumer goods, so that, so that those things remain in line with each other. Uh, that means that instead of trading Bitcoin directly, uh, people would be trading IOUs for, for, for Bitcoin in much the same way that we had uh, gold notes that were IOUs for gold. Uh, so we'd have to be, we'd have to be printing, printing Bitcoin, printing like uh, paper Bitcoin. Uh, in, in order to, to keep prices stable and actually use it as a currency, then eventually we'd get to the point where we'd realize that the underlying Bitcoin is, is holding us back from uh, uh, modulating the flow of spending the way we need to for an efficient economy. We'd graduate away from Bitcoin and we'd end up with a fiat currency again. Okay. That's how Bitcoin can become a currency. Does it also mean that you don't think that gold was ever a good idea? Um, it would it depends what you mean by was ever a good idea. Uh, Gold-backed uh, currency didn't let uh, let the currency supply change in the most useful way. Yes, I, I agree with that statement, um, that, that it was holding us back. I think gold was useful and gold-backed currency was useful because it was part of the process of how we got to where we are today mm -hmm. with, with uh, efficient fiat money. Because people mm -hmm. trusted it and... That kind of thing, or right? You can't. Um, it's you can't really create a currency unless you're bootstrapping it off of uh, something that that people already think has kind of a stable standard value, or 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 what's as stable as possible up to that point. So it's got to be based on something that came before, uh, and gold is what came before. So it was useful in that sense. Yeah. Um, we got three more quotes. I'm not going to get through all of them. <laughs> I uh, did one minute per quote. Yeah. I think uh, we'll just read this part here. Ooh, you like that. In principle, if people want to <laughs> hold more money, a simple solution suggests itself. Print more. In today's world, unlike says, central banks can create more money or ease the terms on which it's obtainable at their own discretion. This should allow them to accommodate the desire to hoard money while leaving enough left over to buy whatever goods and services the economy is capable of producing. But in practice, even this solution appears to have limits. Judging by the disappointing results of monetary expansions since the financial crisis of 2007. But isn't that because it's all through credit? Is that what he means by monetary yes, expansions? Yes, that is correct. It's because we didn't do it through a basic income. Uh, or even through like random other ways of printing money. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we had done it through fiscal policy rather than monetary policy um, and spent it into the economy that way, it would have been better. Uh, and then the optimal um, fiscal fiscal stimulus would have been through a basic income. Yeah. Uh, so that was, that's what was holding us back. It's not because, um, you know, replacing uh, money or, or supplying consumers with money is, is what's limiting us. It's because we didn't have the right, we didn't do it the right way. Yeah. Um, so let's go on. Yeah, and it's interesting because they're saying it as if it should be able to be like never ending that they can just like keep easing this way, but obviously with credit you can't. Uh, you can't do that. Yeah, with credit you run into some instability. 
Uh, today, many people scoff at Say's Law even before they have fully appreciated it. That is a pity. He was wrong to say that economy-wide shortfalls of demand do not happen, but he was right to suggest that they should not happen. Mm. Yes, contrary to popular belief, they serve no salutary economic purpose. There's no good reason why we should have, uh, why we should have uh, recessions or, or oversupply or underproduction. Right. Uh, there's instead something perverse about an economy impoverished by lack of spending. That's yes, a really good point. it is like, the, like a subsistence farmer leaving his field untilled and his belly unfilled, farming less than he'd like even as he eats less than he'd choose. And I'm just yeah, going to read this good. last part. When Say's law fails to so this is the yeah. when Say's <laughs> law fails to hold workers lack jobs because firms lack customers and firms lack customers because workers lack jobs. You were Economists, with you were so close. You were so close, economists. Uh, people need money, not jobs. It's because they lack money. It's because they lack money. Uh, so let's quickly go around and get people's final yeah. thoughts. This Bethany. is super interesting. I like thinking about the history, um, and uh, I still feel like I need to articulate figure out how to articulate better the, the holes in, in Say's Law, but it, it was great. It was great yeah. discussion. Yeah. Uh, Steve? Um, well, in trying to remove uh, money from his theories, I think that was headed in the right direction because uh, at that time and uh, a long time after people thought that money was gold and gold was perhaps the most intrinsically valuable thing possible. Um, but actually, Say seems to understand that, that money is, is just the, the oil that makes the rest of the, you know, the important parts of the, of the mechanism work. Good point. Rob? Yeah, I was thinking it's like the WD-40 of the economy, just so <laughs> keeps the wheels going. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm really curious to see about the global currency and um, kind of see where that project takes off because I feel like that's going to happen inevitably. Yeah. Um, cool. And I guess it kind of ties into to this a little bit. But. Yeah. Elizabeth? Um, I don't feel like I have closing thoughts, so pass. Okay, Richard. Um, Say's Law doesn't appreciate the, the transaction uh, necessary um, the necessity of money in the transactions between different goods and services in the economy and so um, uh, it <clears throat> does it, it sees sees things like labor as ne necessary for the con the economy to function even when there even back then there were things like uh, automation that made labor less and less necessary with um with like the cotton gin and the steam engine and things like that. Cool. Yeah. Uh this was around the time of the Luddites too. By the way, mm, just to put some nice. context in there. Uh, and then Tommy says, uh, my point is that we are seeing another time right now where monetary policy is not being enacted robustly, specifically because we've been unable to get UBI enacted for some awful reason. <laughs> uh, but I guess you're calling a lack of the UBI a failure of monetary policy instead of a failure. Sorry. But I guess you're calling lack of UBI a failure of fiscal policy instead of a failure of monetary policy. Correct. I think uh, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, I think of... You know, you know, and this is how we tend to divide it, is that fiscal policy is taxing and spending, whereas monetary policy is um, ways of influencing the, the right. private financial sector, the financial markets. Um, but there's not a necessarily a clear, just clear line between one and the other, uh, just kind of how we define it. Um, I would say that uh, it would be great if supply created its own demand, and if we had a calibrated basic income, that would make that true. All right. Uh, Thanks for the discussion, everyone. Next week, we're on Wednesday again, and we're talking about uh, Bolsa Familia, which is a social assistance program in Brazil uh, that has some features that are similar to basic income and some that are not. Uh, so, see you guys then. Does that say...